this is the work that we've done in the last year and a half or so, uh, mostly here at the OICR, uh, trying to understand a little bit better what we do, uh, what's the genomic composition of this special type of ovarian cancer. Um, how do I advance okay. the slides? With this? Uh, maybe the left leg. Okay. It seems like it's working. Oh, that's backwards. How can that be backwards? Sure. <laughs> uh, if you press. Oh press no, 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 that's that's okay. No, I just I, that's my second slide actually. Oh, okay. That was the purpose. <laughs> okay, good job. Because that's the first thing I <laughs> the first thing I want to do is acknowledge the fact that this is an OMPRN granted research and is um, and, and, and most of the support has come from Sunnybrook Health Science and Center where I work and uh, OICR. And to that, I, I, I also want to start acknowledging uh, John Barlow, which is my co-API in, um, in this project, and a bunch of people here at the OICR and Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center who had made this possible, particularly Fabian and Lamez and Jasmine Ayusunovic, who not only have done a lot of the bioinformatic analysis or most of it, but have also introduced me to this world of molecular pathology, at which, of which I, did knew, I knew very little before. Um, so they, they've been great, great teachers about that, and I'm great, very grateful for that. Uh, I chose this type of cancer, of ovarian cancer, despite the fact that it's relatively rare. Uh, in, in most databases, comprises less than 5 or 3% of all ovarian cancers. Um, and probably because of its rarity, we know very little about uh, its origins and, and its molecular fingerprinting. Uh, we, uh, there have been very... Uh, various theories theories about uh, where these carcinomas arise, but none of them really confirmed, uh, and that contrasts with the vast knowledge we know we have now about the origin of more common more common types of ovarian cancer, like high grade serous carcinoma. We know that uh, most uh, of those ovarian cancers arise in the fallopian tube. Uh, or precursors in the fallopian tube. Uh, the second most common types of ovarian cancer, which are endometrioid and clear cell, are arising in endometriosis or precursor, cellular precursors in endometriosis. So we have not been able to identify a clear cut precursor for this type of ovarian cancer. Uh, and from the protein expression profile, is also a heterogeneous and rather elusive, elusive disease. Uh, because there's not a single positive marker that can, that can help us distinguish this type of ovarian cancer from other types of ovarian cancer. Uh, and this algorithm that I'm showing you here is, uh, was published a number of years ago, uh, trying to identify markers at the immunohistochemical expression level that can distinguish mucinous from serous from endometrioid uh, carcinomas, all of them which are distinct types of ovarian cancer with very, with very distinct biologic behavior and prognosis. Uh, so serous carcinomas uh, have positive or positive markers or markers of serous differentiation like WT1 and P53 abnormalities. We have markers of clear cell morphology. We have pro hormone protein expression for endometrioid tumors, but there's really nothing that can help us distinguish uh, the mucinous carcinomas from their mimickers. Um, at the molecular expression profile, we are, we're similarly experiencing until recently uh, some sort of, of lack of knowledge in this aspect. Uh, there are certain uh, mutations that have been reported prevalently in the mucinous category, but not at the point at identi identifying them as uh, defining molecular mechanisms of the disease. Uh, we know that high-grade serous carcinomas are basically defined by the presence of TP53 mutations, which happen very early in their histogenesis. Uh, granulosa cell tumors of the ovary are basically defined by the presence of Fox cell 2 mutations. Uh, unfortunately, in the category of mucinous carcinomas, that hasn't been the case. And this is, very, this is a very interesting study done by the Vancouver group, uh, where they identified that the pattern of DNA uh, uh, repair aberrancies uh, in the genome can uh, separate the major types of ovarian cancers in very distinct biological significant groups. The major problem with this very nicely well done study is that the ovarian mucinous carcinomas, again, were not represented. So, uh, so we still don't know how they fit into this molecular based classification algorithm for ovarian cancer. And that's basically what motivated us 
to pursue a genomic approach uh, in our cohort of ovarian cancers. There is some, there is some knowledge uh, up until recently about um, the molecular profile of ovarian mucinous carcinoma, but mostly based on targeted sequencing studies with very limited series. Uh, we know that KRAS uh, mutations and HER2 amplification are prevalent in these tumors. There's another series of genes that have been identified in this uh, small series. And um, the need of this is basic, is, is not only an academic one from the point of classification, uh, but also a, a very important clinical implication of trying to identify these tumors and categorize them correctly at the clinical level. Uh, despite their low frequency, ovarian mucinous carcinomas are, on the, on the clinical perspective, difficult to diagnose because they can highly resemble other things that are not primary mucinous carcinoma. The most important one are tumors that are metastatic to the ovary, particularly from the gastrointestinal tract, less frequently from the breast or from the cervix. They can all display mucinous appearance under the microscope, uh, and therefore highly resemble uh, a mucinous carcinoma. In fact, a, a significant subset of those metastatic cases are initially misdiagnosed as ovarian primary tumors because of their high resem resemblance. As you can imagine, the clinical implications of such misdiagnosis are very important because a metastatic tumor to the ovary is automatically a stage four, it's advanced stage C disease. They will be treated very differently. If they're coming from the gastrointestinal tract, they will be treated with targeted therapies designed for gastric tumors, less, such as HER2 amplification. Whereas if this is a primary ovarian tumor, it's likely to behave like a low-grade malignancy. Most of them are present at uh, early stage and have a very indolent prognosis, uh, and their treatment uh, will be very different and only if they recur. Uh, there are some differences in the protein expression profile between primary and metastatic mucinous carcinomas to the ovary, uh, but the, the, the sensitivity and the specificity of all these uh, protein expression immunohistochemical studies has never been perfect. Um, there is one interesting study from 2015 that we also took as, a, as our background, trying to identify genomic differences between uh, primary ovarian carcinomas and colorectal carcinomas. And they found some e differences, particularly in the rate of APC inactivating mutations, uh, which was very interesting. Unfortunately, they only had seven mucinous ovarian carcinomas, again, because this tumor is rare. So with this background, we decided to uh, attempt a genomic approach to identify a genetic subtype of ovarian cancer, or, or the, the, the profiling of uh, ovarian mucinous carcinoma as a genetic subtype of ovarian cancer. And, and based on that signature, uh, identify elements that could help us in the distinction between primary and metastatic mucinous carcinomas in routine pathologic workup. We use a whole exome sequencing approach uh, to, uh, to achieve this. Uh, and, and, and that was first uh, phase one. And, and once we did this uh, whole exomic sequencing approach, we were, going, we were trying to develop a multi-parametric genomic signature that can accurately distinguish primary from metastatic tumors. This is the cohort that we constructed at the Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. Uh, uh, it's, it's a robust cohort of ovarian cancers, uh, which includes 40 mucinous carcinomas uh, that have been proven to be primary, not only by pathologic and immunohistochemical staining, but also long-term follow-up of those patients, uh, none of which had a primary extra ovarian tumor identified in their clinical follow-up. Um, we also have a much larger cohort of ovarian tumors that were proven to be metastatic, either from the colorectum, appendix, upper GI tract, and endocervix. Um, the pathologic screening uh, for inclusion of these tumors has been very strict uh, and it's been reviewed by specialized pathologists. Uh, we identify formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue. Um, unfortunately, this is something, this kind of studies is something we have to do in archival tissue, uh, which is formalin fixed. Uh, doing this prospectively uh, and attempting to obtain fresh tissue will be very, very cumbersome. Uh, so we decided to uh, use archival material. Uh, that, that fortunately enough was uh, abundant in most of our series and allowed us to identify tumor and match normal tissues uh, for sequencing analysis. This is the demographic uh, distribution of our cases. As I said before, most of them 
present at early indolent stages, and therefore uh, they have a five, most of them were five stage one. Uh, they have different distributions in terms of tumor grade, patterns of invasion, and the follow up. Um, the follow up is important because even though most patients are were alive with no evidence of disease at time to follow up, there are recurrences and tumor related deaths in our cohort, which is pretty much the same distribution that we observe historically. Um, we prepare uh, libraries, and this is the main DNA concentration that we obtain in the 40 uh, cases of primary variomyosinous carcinoma under match controls. This is the coverage data. We initially tried to decide which depth of coverage was going to be uh, best for the identification of uh, clinically significant variables, and I believe we went ahead with a, a coverage of tumor of 100x and a coverage of 50x for uh, the normal match tissue. And this is the variant calling, calling an annotation algorithm that the bioinformatic team he, here at OICR employed to identify a clinic, a, a pathogenic or likely significant uh, SNPs and um, single nucleotide variations. Uh, this is the distribution. Um, that a similar study published in 2015 found in their cohort of 17 primary mucinous carcinomas. Um, and these are our distribution, which was very similar, and that was reassuring uh, in terms of uh, the, the type of uh, variant effect and the amount of variant effect per case. And you can see a, a, a gradient on the amount of uh, single nucleotide uh, variations that we found in our series. And in this plot, you can, it's, it's, it's a busy plot and, and you have small characters there. Uh, but the purpose of that is to show you that concordant to limited previous literature based on uh, targeted panels, we confirmed that the most significant alterations in this tumor type are, are uh, from the SNP uh, point of view is alterations in KRAS and TP53 mutations. Um, uh, there, uh, other than that, this is a very heterogeneous disease. Uh, which also translate on the network uh, or the pathway analysis that we also try to uh, that we also attempted based on this uh, SNP profile. Uh, the pathways that were most frequently altered in this uh, in this subset of poor mucinous carcinomas is listed here. Uh, this is there's really nothing to compare this because there's there's no previous work on uh, on pathway analysis on these tumors. But it was interesting to find you know, to find a number of pathways that are recurrently altered uh, in this subset of cases. Now, with that background, can we differentiate primary ovarian cancers from metastasis of gastrointestinal organs? And I say gastrointestinal because uh, that's, the, that's, the mo that's the majority of metastatic tumors of, to the ovary that could resemble a primary ovarian tumor. And that's the bulk of the tumors that we have represented in, a, in an ovarian cancer database at Sunnybrook. Our database to, to move forward in this regard was to compare uh, the whole, ex sequence, whole exome sequencing data that we have here at OICR with TCI, TCGA, TCGA data on colorectal, gastric, esophageal, and pancreatic uh, adenocarcinomas, as well as uh, the most common type of ovarian carcinoma, which, was, which is the high-grade serous carcinoma, the type that has been extensively reviewed by the TCGA analysis. Um, this is, this is, these are, I'm going to show you images constructed by Fabian and Yasmina and the bioinformatic a team that 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 attempt to uh, 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 perform this, this clustering analysis uh, across our samples and across the, our, the, the, the publicly known TCGA data. Um, unfortunately, we find a lot of dispersion by the, uh, which is likely a byproduct of the gene dropout rather than genes that are truly differentiated. That are truly differentiated over mucinous carcinomas from all these other cancers. Um, when we did clustering uh, based on the whole ex exome sequencing data uh, found in our series and compared to the TCGA, there is some cl clustering. The, the remisinous carcinomas are the, the red here. So there is some clustering. Um, there is also some clustering, not surprisingly, of the high-grade serous carcinomas around the TP53 signature. But as you may remember, TP53 mutations are also highly prevalent in ovarian mucinous carcinoma. And it seems like that's probably the reason why they're clustering so much in this particular uh, clustering diagram. 
KRAS mutations, as I mentioned before, are prevalent. They were seen in over 60 per 60% of our over and mucinous cohort. Um, and, and it's helpful also in this clustering analysis. Unfortunately, the lack of other highly frequent mutations in our database suggests that there is something else uh, that, that, that is allowing for this uh, subgroup clustering that we're not identifying using our whole exome sequencing approach. Um, the KRAS mutational profile, even though it's highly prevalent in our cohort of ovarian mucinous carcinoma, you know, is otherwise really not specific because it's the spectrum of the same hotspot mutations that we see in other tumor types, including gastrointestinal tract primaries. Um, uh, potential alternatives that we, that we are exploring in order to move forward with our uh, distinction algorithm is exploring the methylation patterns, maybe APOBEC DNA se signature, uh, sequencing signatures in our tumors, and maybe using an RNA uh, a, a sequencing approach to determine the levels of gene expression. And that takes me to this very interesting article, which pretty much uh, uh, attempted as something very similar to what we are attempting here. It was published late last year, and it had a nice uh, identification and validation cohort of primary ovarian mucinous carcinomas. Um, they also had a very limited cohort of metastatic carcinomas to the ovary, and they found and, this, and they found uh, certain differences in the genomic profile, not only in the rate of KRAS and P53 mutation, but other genes as well. Um, their, muta their, their cohort of primary ovarian mucinous carcinomas is relatively big. It's, it's 134 cases. That's the largest cohort I know to date. Uh, but the cohort of metastatic cases is relatively small. And I think that's where we have you know, a further opportunity to uh, confirm what they're finding and, for, and, and, and move forward with our own analysis. Um, these are the most frequent findings in the, in the cohort of primary ovarian carcinomas in their hands, which are very similar to what we're finding so far. And there are significant differences from TCGA data, TCGA data from high-grade serous carcinomas and gastric appendicitis and colorectal tumors. So it seems like we are all at, you know, uh, uh, correct in our assumption that there is something at the genomic level that could help us identify these tumors correctly. Um, they also did CNV, and CNV analysis. Uh, and you can see that there are significant differences. These are the ovarian mucinous carcinomas, which they stratified by grade. Uh, uh, and even though there is there's some variation across that cohort of ovarian mucinous carcinomas, there seems to be a difference with the metastatic tumors in terms of their CNV composition. Uh, so CNV analysis, which is which I could not present to you today because it's still in progress, uh, is the next step, and and we're going to see how we integrate uh, structural variants and copy number variations into our SNP algorithm, uh, and how we can move forward with that. And we, as I said before, we're also exploring the possibility of doing methylation analysis and RNA sequencing in our uh, in our cohort. The limitation, the main limitation, will be the fact that we are dealing with form formalin fix and paraffin embedded tissue. But, uh, but we're still going to attempt to obtain um, RNA expression studies on our cohort. Um, and those are the next steps. Uh, with that, I want to thank you again uh, for the support and for being here with me, and I'll answer any questions.